So, yeah, I'll start slowly. And um, then, first of all, welcome everyone to um, my talk and probably your final talk of today. So, you, um, I try to make this easy to, and to relax, to sit down and listen to that. Uh, I know, I also know I'm, I'm the last thing between you and the attendee party at the Guinness Storehouse. So, this is all a bit of an unfortunate situation to be in. Um, but yeah, um, the other thing I wanted to say before I start, you might have always seen that, I have a bit of an, an injury on my left arm that happened on the weekend. Um, and the talk I'm going to give has quite a major part of a, of a demo with it. So it's like a tutorial workshop, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I still have difficulties to type with both hands. So I'm not sure if I can do everything. I asked the conference if it would be possible to cut it down to a regular like length talk, but then in the end decided I will try it that way. So we might be finish a little earlier depending on how things go, but um, we'll see, just as a disclaimer. And I'm not making this up because my demos are so bad. <laughs> um, it's it unfortunately really happened. Okay, so let's get started then. Um, I also just figured out that I probably have to jump in and out of the presentation because I actually want to swipe between, uh, like switch between screens where I have to like this the CLI and the and and Visual Studio Code and so on. This doesn't work when I'm in presentation mode. So yeah, bear with me. Uh, they will always take probably a few seconds to to do that. Okay. So but and I also have this top bar right there that I don't see but you see. Uh, should should be all right. So that's me. Um, my name is Matthias. I'm from, I'm from Germany. I work for a rather small consulting company called Novatech. Um, I also have seen quite a few familiar faces here from the Linux Foundation. Um, so happy to be back on a stage and in conference with people. So maybe some people know me and if they know me, they probably know me through um, my job at Novatech. What most people probably don't know, I'm also teaching at two universities in the area of Stuttgart, um, where I do things around distributed systems. Well, distributed systems is a bit of an, like an old gray topic, so I try to do distributed systems with modern technologies. And yeah, containers are definitely a an, an, uh, an very important part there. So some of the things you probably see today will have its, its source of origin in, in, in the lectures. Now, in a nutshell, what this is going to be about. Um, a situation probably many developers will be familiar with um, to get your source code or your application into a container image. And um, this is an, an entry level talk, so I'm not gonna go through what all the things, what is a container, what is an image, but I briefly introduce that. And then I'm going to walk through various options and um, try to, to show what I think is, works better or worse with the different ones. Also important to say, I'm not bound or like affiliated with any kind of vendors or technologies. So um, we're not getting any money to say Docker is great or Docker is bad or whatsoever. Um, it's more like I just want to kind of highlight that there might not only be one solution and it might be worth to take a look at a few different ones because they might be better for certain purposes. So I've just mentioned Docker and um, it probably is difficult to talk about containers without talking about Docker. So the initial way most people will probably get to building a Docker container or like a container in general is a thing called a Docker file. And I'm going to also use this as a bit of a reference. What can you do with it? And what can't you do with it? What might be good, what might be bad? And then have a look into various other technologies. Um, I'm definitely gonna mention things around cloud native build packs and Paketo. Also look into open source project, projects from Google called Chip and Co. And um, maybe say a few words about um, OpenShift source to image. Now, for the format of this talk, I've, I've never given it in, in this kind of style, and um, I've also just recently added a few, uh, some more things. I also offer this as a lab, but I think 90 minutes might, also, might actually be a bit short for everyone to go through. And compared to, like my, I think, the, two, the previous speaker here, I don't have a setup environment for you that you can basically log into and run. 
I mean, if you want to follow along, it, you're totally fine. Basically, what you need is a, uh, a container daemon. Uh, and for some exercises, you might need a Java runtime. Um, and, and that's about that. But an anyway, I'll, I will do the things live, or I will try to do the things live. And um, you are very well invited to follow along. If you, um, but anyway, this is not, if you want to play through the things by yourself, I just do that to step out of the presentation real quick. Um, so where's the browser? So I, this is basically where the link goes to. And there is like a, a lab walkthrough instructions that takes you to the various steps. It will also tell you what you need to do that. It's not much, um, easily installable on, um, on any kind of machine. And then you can just also watch now and play through the steps later by yourself if you want to. This is, this is free and open and available, so you can always do that. Um, all right. Anyway, if you have your laptop in front of you and have the thing set up, you're very well invited to, to do that alongside with me. All fine. Also, um, I would, of course, like to have this as, as interactive as possible. So um, I don't have a super strict agenda how I want to go through this and where I place the demo parts and, and, and the theory parts. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to, to tell me. And I'm always happy to do things on the side of if, if, uh, if there's the possibility. All right. So the, I think the very origin of this talk was actually a question from a colleague of mine, which has already happened a bit a while ago. Um, he came to me and said, well, Matthias, you're doing quite a bit of things with containers. And in their project, they need to build containers for the Java application and ask me what is like the best Java base container, base container image. I'm sorry. And I'm a consultant. What would I answer, of course? It depends, right? I mean, I, I don't have a straight answer for that. So I would, of course, want to know what are the things they're going to do and where is it embedded and what is the workflow and so on. But um, based on that, it kind of raised the idea to me to, to like build this talk or build this, this evaluation um, as probably more people have that problem. So before we go into that, we first want to look basically quickly what is like a container or a container image or a container itself. Uh, because that's, of course, a bit important if you want to improve your container image builds. You probably need to understand a little bit what is the technology around that. Now, I said I'm not going to lose much time there, and most of the things have probably been explained today already. But in general, if you want to run an application, you normally run that on an operating system where you have some libraries and dependencies in between. Now, the initial idea of a container was basically to separate the application along with its libraries and dependencies from the underlying shared operating system stuff. Um, and to basically make it portable and executable in, 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 various, uh, in various environments. Now, the, the idea of, um, of containers wasn't really to just build that container thing. It kind of evolved. Use coming from the technologies, namespaces, change root, and C groups. I'm not sure who has been in that very first talk in this room today by Gerolf. I, think I was there too. That was really good. So. That, that's also where I learned a few more things about namespaces that I didn't know yet. Um, in general, this is just for you, basically, that everybody should be on the same page to say, well, if I use a certain kind of container daemon, this is basically a, a, a process or a, a server application, or um, depending on which form it, it, it comes, that will handle all those things for you to work on namespaces, change root, and C groups under the cover. So though that you don't have to worry about that and have basically a, a, like a neat API to, to handle those things. So that's the part about containers. Now, container images are basically the templates or blueprints that you can have or use to basically rather run or instantiate as containers. So the container daemon will be able to load those images or grab them from various repositories and then start the container of whatever is given in such an image. And as we are looking, sorry for that squeezing, that's the stage and I, I can't stand still, so apologies for that. Um, now, looking into those uh, images, this will basically be our most important thing because if we want to improve 
build the, the way our images are built, we should basically understand a bit about their structure. So in general, the way things started very much with, with Docker was basically that you have that concept of an image in a container with a run command, you would instantiate it, and with a then you could do changes in that instance, and with a commit, you could go back to a new image that basically would manifest all the changes inside of that image. So in case of a Java application here, you would say I need a base OS container, I also need to install the Java runtime, I need to copy that application, and then I had roughly speak, speaking three layers with an Ubuntu, Java, and the app on top. This could of course get more complex and, and error prone um, of whatever type um, of, of applications you have installed. So Docker realized that very early. Um, I tried to, to make a bit of a research on the Docker history. I think it came out in March 2013 and in May 2013 there was the first mention of this concept of a so-called Docker file. Now this Docker file kind of works a bit like a script where you have different steps that you basically do and then you summarize all that individual steps that I said before. So in this case you would say I have this, this base image Ubuntu 2010 then I install the Java runtime, then I copy um, a char file from outside into my container and execute the command. And, and technically under the hood, each of those steps would be like a new commit and, uh, and a new instantiation of a container. And in the end, you have to finalize containers and all those steps, I'm sorry, build the individual layers in your, in your container. Now, if you, if you do that, you could of course play around with these um, base images. So in this case, I took a plain operating system base image. That means it only comes with standard operating system binaries. Nothing prone to programming languages and such. There are also base images that already bring along runtimes or dependencies, libraries, whatever you might need for your, um, um, for your certain language implementation. I was actually using this um, slide for quite a bit until I realized looking at the Docker Hub, that this image is actually deprecated in the meantime. That means, <laughs> I should actually, and I know this is recorded and I shouldn't say this, I was actually running laps on this and nobody noticed that it's deprecated. So th this is actually one of the important things also um, about this talk, that no matter which option you take, you will have basically a certain source where you pull your information or your, uh, your binaries from, and you need to trust that source. So, and, and you also need to be aware of like how, um, how often are things updated, is this being maintained and so on. And this is also the dangerous thing with those Docker files that you might pull in things and they work, but as you, you're, like the part that you are interested in this application is most likely on that end, like where you build your application and not so much on the base image side. So people tend to neglect that. Even I, I did myself. Um, and then I realized, okay, it's still there, it still works, but I should probably update it as the people have told me so. So um, they, uh, the web page redirected me to, to that image. It was actually, of course, really easy to exchange. Um, but there are more. So especially, I mean, not the entire talk will be based on the Java image, but um, in particular with Java, you can do quite, you have the problem of really many options um, of your base container image, and that brings in the bit of difficulties there. So in the end, I don't want to open up Docker Hub right now, but if you start searching there, you would find plenty of, of those images. Now, finally, we can go back to the question of my colleague, what is the best Java base container image? We don't know. We only know that there are many out there, and uh, we still need kind of a decision process of, of, of what might be the best one to start with. Now, looking at the things from a bit from a different angle, um, it's mostly like, how do you actually use your base container image? Where is that being embedded in your um, software development chain? And nowadays, as a lot of applications are, are running on the technology of Kubernetes, a kind of typical workflow looks like that like code and then potentially test. I haven't reflected this in the chart yet here, but code, build, put it into a container and, and run it somewhere. So the scope of the Docker file is normally the containerization step. 
Um, and the idea of such a pipeline is, of course, to make things repeatable and um, basically gaining confidence and security in the process if you can right, re-execute it all the time. So the Docker file is one step where you have an, a repeatable process where you know this just works and this does exactly what it's supposed to do. Now, if this is already given for that, why would you not want to extend this scope and say, uh, if it's so good for the containerization step and it standardizes things, why would we not want to use it for like a, a build step as well? Looking back at the Docker file, that of course would mean you first have to install the build tools on the operating system image, then copy the source, build the source, potentially remove the build tools because you want to have your image as small as possible, install a runtime, configure everything and run it. So that can get more complicated than the plain Docker files we've seen before. Docker also realized that and came up with a thing called the multi-stage support, where it was possible to separate the, the Docker file into stages. So we're still talking about that script style here, but I highlight this with different colors. In this, in this Docker file, we're actually building two different images. So the first one we're gonna build, um, and I'm, I'm using a Maven container here, so this one comes with a build environment for Java. This one would actually copy the source, all the source information into that container, and then build all the source and come back with a char file. And given that it's running in a container, we can of course go sure it will always take the same builder. It will always happen in the same way. So the outcome is always supposed to be the same, which, makes, which can have definitely improve a pipeline as if people, in the worst case, check in the char files from somewhere where they build it on their own. So this makes sure the build step is basically standardized. Now, the next one is like the run step, where we just take another, oh, I can see another deprecated image as a base image. And <laughs> I have to update that slide, uh, I just noticed that. Um, and then copy that char file from the initial container into the next one. So we kind of basically separated the build and run image step within the Docker file. So moving forward, this, the development within Docker didn't come to an end. In 2018, they started coming up with a new technology called BuildKit. And um, this was definitely very new as opposed to the thing they did with Docker files before. So it kind of went away from a simple sh shell kind of behavior where each step would just be executed and um, like a commit and, and run step and adding a new layer. So that really brought up, became like kind of, kind of an engine um, where a lot of things were improved. So especially caching was, uh, of the individual layers was completely rewritten. Security concepts were Im improved, then images to, to become smaller, better flow lodging, and so on. In the end, it didn't really make Docker files less complex. It more like turned them into a bit of a programming language where you can have like, um, if this happens, then execute that stage, or those stages don't depend on each other, so we can run them in parallel, and so on. Um, while it makes your Docker file probably more efficient, on the other hand, it increases the, the skill requirement to actually execute those files. Now, the old syntax still th does work. The only thing you might see here on the top is that um, actually common file where you specify the so-called front-end image. So with the new build mechanism, you have like a back-end image that does all the processing and the front-end image, which basically defines all the functionality which is possible in, um, in, the, in the syntax of the actual Docker file. So, and then you can change also to things where I say, well, I want to try some experimental features which are not in like in a released version um, at the time. So one of the cool things that got also added with, um, with this uh, new build kit implementation was the concept that you can do caching or mounting an external file system. Well, while this was already possible, of course, with plain Docker containers, it wasn't possible during the Docker build steps. Um, and now with this, of course, it makes it possible if you build your application and rebuild it a lot, um, that you don't have to download all the artifacts um, over and over again, just if you change one line of code. I mean, particularly people that use Maven or NPM will kind of know what I'm, what I'm talking about here. So to sum things up, 
um, what we have learned from the evolution of Docker files, to say what makes a container image good, we could of course see there is yeah, speed, how fast can you build it, the size, how big is it in the end, like from a certain tendency, smaller is of course better because then you don't need as much storage. Also the structure in the, in the file is, is important, the degree of standardization and security. Now, one thing or one consideration that I wanted to go quickly into, and this might not be applicable to all programming languages, um, but for some it does, is, of course, I said it before, um, have your image as small as possible. That's, that's, that's all right. Um, but I very often see people trying to squeeze out like every kind of megabyte on those base operating system layer and spend the time of, of building like small footprint uh, base operating system images that they don't have to maintain. Um, technically, the sum, like the, the, the full footprint of an image is the sum of all layers. In the end, the application layer will most likely be the one that changes most because whenever you add, change some code, you will get a new application layer. This sometimes might also change dependencies, but it should rarely change the operating system layer. The point that I'm trying to make is the way a container daemon works, if it downloads an image once, it downloads all the other layers. So when it has downloaded that operating system layer once, it probably won't download it over and over again unless you explicitly tell it so. so Size optimization on the base layer is probably not very efficient. But structuring of the application layer might be, because in this case, again, in a Java example, the application layer normally consists of like class files, resource files, and dependency files. And, and even if you just change a single line of code, the overall application layer will be rebuilt. Now, there is something you can do here um, in this case, um, you will basically extract th out, things out of the char file and copy them independently into your run image. That technically means you get like a, a container image layer for each one of those. And if you do just a single change in a, in a, in a source code file, then it will only change this layer in the class files and only, all the rest of the layers will remain. And normally this kind of gives a much more of a performance Im uh, improvement because we're talking about normally kilobytes here. So this will be really, really quickly to load. Um, the, other, the other layers will take long to load on the first run, but once they're there, um, you don't have to worry about them anymore. So I would recommend much more to invest in, in that space to say, can we actually improve or optimize something than trying to find the smallest footprint base layer image because most likely it will be loaded only once. I mean, of course, I'm not saying base operating system images with three gigabytes are totally fine. I mean, you keep them at a reasonable size, um, but try to optimize at the right end. All right, so let's look at the time. So we're half, half an hour in. So yeah, what I'm just probably gonna do now is stop the slideshow for a second and repeat some of the things that I have just talked about. Or while I'm bringing this up, also, are there any questions as of now? No? Okay, so I'm just going to try to arrange the windows in a better way. So I have my environment here. Um, I don't think I have anything running. I only have pre-downloaded one of the images here with 1.2 gigabytes because I'm, I, wasn't, I wasn't super sure about the, the network here in the, on the conference. And I, I don't have any backup or fallback. If my demos won't work, they're not gonna work. I don't have a plan B. So a uh, very, very honest style of presentation though. Now, yeah, let's, let's have a look into that first example. So I have um, many, Docker files, as you can see here. And I'm going to 
set Docker back to the way as it initially was. So this was a time prior to BuildKit. Probably have most of people have started that way. So we're already in the Java folder. And the way I've seen most of the Docker files is basically that they take the code from outside. So like I do now, people would build their application on their machine and then run, um, put it into a Docker file. That is, of course, a bit dangerous because it's not guaranteed that the build will always be identical and reproducible. Um, as things on certain machines might, of course, change, might maybe they have, built, have been built with a different JDK and so on. This is really difficult to see later on once they are in, um, in a container. Nevertheless, um, it will still work fine with such a Docker file. So we're going to look at a simple one. Um, this is the one where, where I basically install the Java on top of Ubuntu. So let's just execute this. I hope this back and forth is not too annoying. But as I said, I, I definitely can't type it um, with, my, with my left arm here. So as you can see now, for those who are doing this the first time, it basically pulls the images that it doesn't have from the repository, uh, which is a Docker Hub in this case, and then executes all the installation steps. And of course, with this one, I'm trying to show what is, what is a bit bad here. You have to redo those things over and over again. Um, and basically, you're probably trying to solve a problem which has already solved by somebody else. Um, eventually, you're gonna get your image. So we're gonna have this image, which is like six seconds ago. And if I look into the history of that image, so I'm just typing the 79E, which is like the... We can, all, we can basically see all those steps that have been listed in the Docker file. So we have the base image. Here we basically install the Java. And here we have 20 megabytes, which is the char file that I put into the, the container um, that I have previously built. In a similar way, I could... No. I could use the, the deprecated adopt open JDK. Um, and also very important to see here, um, there is no deprecation notice on the Docker execution. So it is an, an image which is still around on the Docker Hub. Um, there is a warning on that website, but there is no special tag or whatsoever on that image. So if I run that in the pipeline or I have that in, in, a, in a script from, from development, it will be hard for me to see that I'm actually building upon something uh, which is not really recommended anymore. So this also incre increases the responsibility on developer side that they don't only need to check for their application, but they also need to validate whatever is in, the, in, their, in their base operating system container should also be fine. So yeah, so I could basically build a lot of images and as the network does really well, so I'm going to do that now. I'm always happy with the demo works. Um, but yeah, I think you get the point. Um, in the end, we can see that we have a couple of images here. They slightly vary in size. So normally the docker history command is something which can help you here to see um, on a high level basis how has this image actually been constructed. If you want to know more, there is an open source tool which is called Dive, um, which I guess most people know in the meantime. Um, this is like a command line browser for your container images. So basically here on the left side, you see all the layers in your image, and then you can browse through them. And on the right side, you can see what has actually changed in the container. So if you want to really go on a deep dive um, in, your, um, in your application, in your, in your container, then this would be a way to do so. I'm not going to go into that depth, but just for you basically to see. Okay, so now we're going to look quickly at those um, multi-stage files. So if I do this multi-stage right here, and I'm, we can have a quick look at the code again, if I ever find the right screen. So, so 
So here you can see I first pull that build image, which is happening, I'm sorry, too many things open. Which is basically happening now, so it pulls that image first, then it copies in the source code and it builds the source code. Now, of course, the advantage with this approach is I don't need any Java or whatever Go Ruby implementation on my machine because all the build part will be happening inside of a container. And if I reuse the same base container image, I can also go sure that everybody who executes that file will get an identical um, run image in the end. So this is something I can probably not guarantee if everybody builds the code on their own machine and then copies it into an, um, a container image. The downside, as you can see, it's of course not getting faster because um, inside of the container, the container doesn't know um, that it has been built on that machine 20 times before. So it's always starting again and I mean, it will notice it if nothing changes. So right now it's using everything from the cache. But if I just go in there and say, well, give me a second, I'm changing something very minimal. So this is not a big change in the business logic. Um, and run it again. Then of course you will see that this build command will run over and over again. So, if that happens somewhere in a pipeline, it's probably that not that much of a drama. If that happens on your development workstation, I think your developer might get a bit bored if they have to run through this all the time. Now for that, um, we, will have, we will have a look into this build kit technology. So when this one has been built, has finished, well, I'll just make it finished. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can watch it in the end again if you really want to. But anyway, so um, I'm using, I'm changing my Docker behavior now and try to build this again. So the first thing you will be able to see, the, the output looks a little different. I got a, a better split down of, of the individual steps, what I have happening or what I have to happen. And now it's running again in that, in that build process before it switches over to the run part of the application. And again, the first time it will take all the time because it needs to build its cache. But once it's there, now I'm actually, I'm just noticing I'm using still one which doesn't use the caching, so I should probably use that one that uses the caching. Ah, this is the multi-stage cache. Yeah, I'm getting, getting, getting confused with so many different uh, Docker file names. Um, so I probably have to type that. So this looks better. So if I repeat that here, this will already hopefully be able to pick up the cache from before. No, it doesn't. Yeah, so the reason is because I am using now this other front end image. Um, it uses, I think, a different mechanism for caching, um, which wasn't the case for the previous build. This final run, we still have to wait, and then we're, we're done with this. And I can switch back to a few more slides. All right, so this looks okay. Now I'm going to do the same thing again as I did before. I'm going into my application file and just modifying the method signature um, and running this cache part again. And now you can, when it comes to this part, you can see it doesn't download a lot of things. It just rebuilds and pulls in um, the cache from the file system. Of course, there's, there are also pros and cons to that. I mean, in this case, it fully relies on the cache on my machine, which is outside of the container daemon. 
So potentially there could also be harmful things happen on my machine, which the cache would then pull in. Um, if you want to do it clean and reproducible, then don't use the cache. If you want to do it fast, for, just for development purposes, it's of course a big help. All right, so I think the last, and anyway, one thing I wanted to show, no matter what we did with the previous images. So if I do a Docker history on that very last file, you will see that there might be difference in the setup here. What is what always going to be the same is the almost 20 megabytes of the application. So let's just see another. That is DC2. And we see the same thing down. So um, we, we really haven't improved yet on the, on the aspect of splitting the actual application part into like structured layers. I have this layered image here. So this basically is, is a three-stage image. The first one will actually build the application. The next step will split it into parts. And the third one will basically use those parts um, in the final image. So, I'm invoking that. And that, of course, also uses the cache, so it doesn't rebuild it. And this, um, this extraction part only took less than a second. So we should have a new image here. Um, sorry. This one that has been filled 40 seconds ago. And if I do a Docker history there now, then you can see that this top section has been kind of split down further. And we can also see that the, from the 19.7 megabytes that we had before, 19.6 megabytes are dependencies. The actual class part is only, is only that. And if I now do a minor change again and rebuild it using that style, it will only have to exchange that layer in there. And uh, if you do that very often, that would probably increase your performance of the overall process much more as if, if you would save one or the other megabytes in any layers down there. All right, so much for that. Um, let's go and see some more alternatives in, in case there are no questions. There's a question. Um, with the cache parameter, you gave a directory name, and, yes. and that's the part which is kept outside persistently. Exactly. Okay. As that's like M two is like the name for the for the Maven. No, it's not. Not in this one. Or is it here? There was some M two directory. Yeah. Yeah. This is like basically. Um, well, I think this is actually the directory in the container, and where it's mapped to the out and the outside file system. This is based what the, the Docker daemon takes care of. I don't think you can specify that. Or maybe you can, but I, I, I don't know. But yeah, this is basically this command in, enables just um, that the mount, uh, like the, the caching mechanism of Docker, and has nothing really to do with that Maven part. It just basically tells that dot, dot, dot .m2 is like the cache folder of Maven. All right, so thanks for that. Um, Oh yeah, please. Uh, so so .m2 is uh, maybe specific. Yes, exactly. So yeah, if you have like an NPM or whatever kind of build mechanism for other languages, then you need to be aware which is the directory you need to have in your uh, in your con in your container um, where the the build process will look into. Good. Thanks for clarifying. All right. So um, going stepping away from from Docker now that we've seen what you can do there and what are other technologies that, that might relate to it. Um, a, a friend of mine has kind of sketched this, uh, this, this time scale of like container and, and, and build mechanisms evolution. And um, a couple of interesting things there. So you can already see that a certain technology is called build packs already existed prior to the arrival of Docker. Um, this is definitely one thing that we're going to look into. Those build packs have been initially brought up by a company called Heroku. They were later on adopted by, by Cloud Foundry, made open source there. 
Then other few approaches was like, for example, putting the Docker build mechanism into Maven or Gradle, like Spotify did. And then not only those things changed, also a lot of things in the container world changed. So there were new container engines. There was an, uh, a specification of an image format, the OCI, which made it a lot easier for companies not being Docker, also build images that would be able to run anywhere and so on. So I'm not going to read through all of that, but just to see a lot of things have happened. And some of the things we're going to look into, we're going to do now. So um, one thing to highlight would be the um, tooling called Chip. This is coming from, from Google, our sponsor. <laughs> Um, and it's a dedicated uh, build mechanism for Java applications, but not really Java, but let's say JVM-based applications. So Kotlin and, and GUI would work as well. Um, and it it's basically just works as a plugin. So um, if you have Maven or Gradle as a build mechanism, you just put in that plugin, and then you get your application in a container. It's really quick. It's really fast forward. One of the interesting things that you see on that picture is the thing that you don't see. And what I mean is, this doesn't require any kind of container daemon. So if you build a, doc a container using a Docker file, you will need a container daemon for like the processing of that and always the re-instantiation and the manifestation of the image. So this one just does that on a uh, level of the binary itself and it creates an, an image which you then can basically upload to a container registry. You can export it as a tar file. Or if you, have, if you happen to have a container daemon running, you can always also build it against that daemon so it ends up in that local registry. But it doesn't need it to be built. That's basically the important part there. And going back into the, this thing I, sh I showed before about the application being split into layers, this is basically something that that chip does out of the box. So I can sh also show that real quick again. This always takes a bit, I don't know why. Um, so let me look at my script. So we've done all this, that worked well. Now we're going to look at chip. So in the end, um, this is like your Maven command, um, where you just have to add this section here, and then your application will be built. There are many different ways. As I say, if you do a Docker build, then it's going to be end up in my local registry. If I only do a build, then it's going to be pushed to, um, to a container daemon. Anyway, that, uh, to a container registry. Anyway, that means... I should be logged into that, so it can actually do that. So now it runs. And what I could have shown, of course, you might not believe me, but I can stop. <laughs> I can stop my, docker, my local Docker daemon. So I hope this won't break all the things. Because I, did the, I told you I don't need it, and I still did the build while it was running. Um, well, it's definitely not running now. Okay, and I can still do that. So you see, this totally works fine. And it didn't only build the, um, the image, it also uploaded it. So if I look at my personal, so this one a few seconds ago, that was just pushed right now. So it's in one step, you build your application, you build your container, and you upload it. So um, of course, the drawback with that one is it, this works only with, with Java. Um, but um, if you use any JVM build uh, based environment, this is, of course, something um, which can definitely improve your, your, your process there. And as Google is a company which is probably not going to go away in the next few weeks, it might also be a reliable source for the, for the image building mechanisms. I mean, Google has been known to stop certain projects just out of nowhere, um, but this one has been around for a while, 
And in case it's not going to be there anymore, you can still use other ones. But I definitely wanted to show this as, an, as one alternative. Now, next to chip, there is, I'm going to jump in there again. So I'm going to postpone the, the demo for that. There is also a tool called Co, um, which is technically speaking chip for Go applications. So it's a, also a dedicated build mechanisms. If you want to build containers um, for uh, the Go programming language, then you can invoke it in a simple, basically you install this as a command line tool and just execute Co in the directory where your application is, and it's going to build and package it straight away. And of course, also uploads it to your, to your registry if you need to. Question? Uh, can you speak a little louder? Okay. Um, by not having a Docker daemon, yeah. actually these are very useful in uh, pipelines, for example. This is a very good point. Um, thanks for bringing it up. Um, yeah. If you run the things all on your developer machine, it's probably not, you don't have many restrictions of what you set up and, and how you build things. But if you run in a, um, in a pipeline-based CI-CD environment, you might have limitations of what you are allowed to, to run. And I have seen environments where, Jenk where there were Jenkins build nodes where you were not allowed to install a Docker daemon. And that basically made it impossible to, um, to build those images there using that technology. Now, using chip or co, you don't have that problem. Um, you only you basically use standard build tools that don't interact with a daemon that requires whatever certain uh, administrative rights. Um, yeah, good point. I, I, said, I, 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 I could claim now, I've said it in earlier presentations, I forgot it today, but I give all the credits to you. So, so <laughs> thanks for bringing that up. Um, all right, yeah. more questions? Yeah. What about caching with these tools? Um, that's a good point. Uh, well. I can only answer that for, um, for the Java variant. Um, basically, you execute Maven still locally. So you need a local Maven installation and you need a local Java installation. That means you also have your local Maven cache, no matter if you use chip or not. That's basically running independent of that. But then again, this goes also back to the problem I said before, you build on your local machine. Yeah. I mean. There's one death you have to die. Um, I mean, you could potentially, I've tried it before, you, but then of course you read the Docker daemon again. You could run your chip execution inside of a container to make sure it doesn't use any local cache and have it reproducible in that style. But then of course, running a container means running, running a daemon. So it's one or the other. Good point though. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about build packs. And um, yeah, I might actually use all of my time, I'm realizing it now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks for hanging in there. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna come to an end. Um, now, build packs, for those who have never worked with Heroku or Cloud Foundry, um, were basically an initial idea which was very similar to the concept of, um, of a container. They originate in, in the idea of, of a pass, where, um, where a pass would claim, you as a developer, you give us your source code and you don't worry about anything and we care about all of the rest. Sounds pretty good, doesn't always work that way, but one of the things that worked pretty well was that concept of, that, uh, of, those, of those build packs. So if a, if a platform claims to be able to handle your code, it needs to build and run it somehow. And the way the build packs worked was like you upload your code and then a mechanism would, would kick in to say, well, I can detect now this is Java, Ruby, Go or whatsoever. Then I can evaluate if I have a kind of a build and run environment for that. And if I have that, I put it together into a kind of runnable format, which is like one executable that contains everything that it needs. Basic, very similar to a container image. The difference in, in, in that approach was that here, the, um, the, pack, the detection, the packaging, and the runtime was totally outside of the, of the, of the developer. This has, of course, changed with um, Docker and Kubernetes becoming so popular. 
because then, of course, the, the, the requirement will not only come up with a source code, but also maybe come up with a packaged um, environment in a way like to go a bit more into that you build it, you run it fashion. Anyway, um, as those container technologies became so popular, um, it didn't mean the idea of a build pack would totally be lost. So especially, um, this is a bit of a, of a timeline here. Well, Heroku started with that as a, as a commercial offering. Then Cloud Foundry adopted that for like an open source implementation. Heroku continued, but they were both basically within their path scope. Now, seeing that uh, containers and Kubernetes having such like a big adoption, they said, why don't we come up with a, with a build pack idea that doesn't run within the pass, but runs outside of it, but still provides the advantages of developers not having to worry so much about their actual build process. Now, cloud native build packs are like um, a, a definition of, of how things should be implemented. And then everybody could, can build their own builders or build packs. And one of those implementations is Paketo that we're going to look into our samples today. So from a flow perspective, this, this technology definitely requires a container daemon. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So it's totally based on that concept. So it has an own CLI. So the idea is that you just run, say, pack in the directory where you want to execute your, um, your build mechanism. Then the, um, the, the, the application basically downloads a so-called builder image. This is a big, very big image that contains the detection, the lifecycle mechanism, and all potentially necessary needed build packs. Downloads all of them at once. Then it puts the code in there, and then it's being processed in there. So there will be a detection mechanism. Yeah, what kind of code is that? How I'm going to, to build that? And then a certain image is coming out in the end. Um, <clears throat> with a structure of a base OS image um, and, and various layers that the, that the individual build packs provide. Another interesting feature that those build packs come up with is a so -called, this so-called rebasing option. Now, in the beginning of the talk, I told you it's probably more important um, to focus on the application layers because they, they, they might change a lot. Now I'm going to put the focus more on, could there also be a scenario when you have to ex exchange a base layer? And the answer is, of course, yes, there can be, because sometimes your application might be built and running and everything is fine. And then there are suddenly things in the, in the news like a log for, log for uh, J or heart bleed or whatever vulnerability. And you might be very worried that you are affected with your own environment. And this is particularly dangerous with using containers because, as I said before, software developers will probably most know what is going on in there and just happy to have this base layer. But if there is something, some kind of exploit in the base layer that they pulled in via a Docker file, it's really hard basically to make them responsible for that because they won't be able to, to, to scan and do all that. So with this rebase functionality, um, you, can, you can leverage that and say, well, okay, um, there is a certain problem here, and I'm just going to rebase all my images that use that behavior, and then I know the base image is updated and everything is fine. Where you can see how that works is in one of the implementations. It's called Paketo. Um, which I think is also Greek and stands for package or packet. Um, now, Paketo has a couple of different runtime and, and, and language support. And this is exactly where the positive effect of this rebase mechanism kind of kicks in. Like, if you run a polyglot application or microservice application in your Kubernetes environment, where you might have your front end with Node, um, some components with Go, some, some Java components all working together. And each individual application development team would build their own container images, then they would most likely also always select their own kind of base images. And if some of such, if, if such an exploit is being um, uncovered, 
I mean, the first thing that people would think about is like, am I affected? And how could I find out where am I affected? I think um, I've heard one, one person in the, in the, uh, from the initial Cloud Foundry creators, they did a, uh, a survey at a major automotive company um, to ask how many different operating si system levels, like not different versions or vendors, but also patch levels and everything, do you have across the company? And they came back with about 300 to 500. It, not only containers, but VMs and, and everything. Now imagine you have to go through all those three or 500 to find out, is this a potential risk or is it not? In turn, Cloud Foundry had only one base image for any kind of application. So that means if, if a certain thing was happening, then it was immediately clear, okay, all of them are affected or none of them is affected. And this is the same thing you can achieve if you use that for as many things as you have in your environment. I did, the I did a similar experiment with my students in the lecture. So I said to them, we're going to build a small microservice application or distributed application with like a front end and a back end and a database. And the only thing we're going to say, there is a certain REST API definition between front end and back end, which always needs to be the same. But you're going to go together in teams of two and everybody writes a front end and the back end. And please pick your own language of choice. And in the end, it needs to be containerized and you're going to send me all the, the, the repos and the Docker files. By the end, of course, I had 20 to 30 different base images. I mean, that's just the nature of things. And I didn't even tell them, like, I'd use this one or that one. I mean, they just go out and see and look what works and, and they will use it. And um, of course, this doesn't reflect like professional developer environments, most hopefully the companies will have scans in their CI CD pipelines to go sure like the images are okay, but it's probably even better if you don't have to worry about it in the first place because you have a mechanism that takes care out of it, takes care of it. Of course, it won't work for everything because the build packs have limitations um, in terms of coverage, what they support, but at least I think that's the, that's the right direction to, to think towards. All right. Now, um, I think I'm coming also to an end here with the slide. So um, again, for a Java application, it works in the same way. You, you invoke pack, build packs are being executed. This one also automatically like um, separates into class, resource, and dependency chars. Um, in case if you have a... Um, Spring Boot application, you can also use this as a, as a Maven or Gradle plugin. But personally, I would actually say this one is kind of better because you, then you don't need to execute Maven locally. Everything is be fully covered in your, um, in your build process. Now, to come back to the question of my colleague that I actually never answered, uh, <laughs> um, I said, well, I, I, I don't know. And, um, I ask counter question. It's like who that same thing I try to explain to you. Like who owns that image? If something goes wrong with that application, who is going to be called? I mean, I said, I said do, do you, maybe do you have a certain kind of white list of base images that you can use in your in your environment? Something that the client maintains? Then you're absolutely fine. You don't. The developer doesn't need to worry about that. They just select from the pool, and they're outside of that decision process. If they don't have it, and every developer is free to change their own base image, that, that can be definitely risky. Also, like who owns the build process? Who would detect if something goes wrong? These are all the things you need to consider. And if you know that, then you have seen a couple of technologies you might be able to, to place and do them. So yeah, going back to a few demo steps, I mean, the rest of that is, is pretty straightforward because I only have to execute one command. Um, so I have stopped with that chip thing. The only thing I'm going to do is I'm also going to build this against my local. So with that Docker build target, it kind of builds it to my local image registry and not, it's not going to upload it directly to the Docker hub. So just to show you. Mm, sorry. 
Now, one of the interesting things is that chip image you will not find in a range of whatever minutes, seconds ago. You will surprisingly find uh, on the bottom, and it says 52 years ago. So we just, yeah, we just traveled in time. Now, um, what, what this means is, or the reason for that, and you will see the same behavior later on when we're going to do the, um, the build pack thing, is, is that if you do a Docker build, the, the timestamp of your build step will basically walk into your image ID. So if you do a total identical build at two different points in time, independent of each other, you will get a different image ID because the timestamp is, is a part of that. And the only way to avoid that is basically to set a certain designated timestamp, potentially somewhere in the past, um, which will basically be the same for every image. Of course, it's not very pleasant from this perspective. So in both chip and in build packs, you can turn it off and say, use the current timestamp. Um, and then it will show up on, on the top like all the other image. The price you basically pay is that consistent behavior um, of having that uh, manifested in your image ID. Now, I'm going to do that pack step, the final thing. So it goes now into the detection mechanism. So I have to scroll a little bit up. I mean, one of the things you will see, you get a lot more output with those build packs of what is happening under the cover. So this is, this is basically everything that it found. These are the build packs that are going to be used. Um, and I detected, okay, Java 11. Um, it, also, it already had downloaded the JDK before. So it goes through that, builds the code, and comes out with an image in the end. So if you look into that, this is actually 42 years old. So it's 10 years younger than the one from Google. Um, anyway, if you look into them real quick, so Docker history, I'm going to look at the chip one first you will be able to see that here we also have this separation of dependency resources and classes, where the classes are like particularly small. The dependencies are basically the majority of, of all that. I think the Paketo one does look a little different. They have their, yeah, this one is actually not as descriptive in the history. Um, but you, you can still guess. So this 19.6, I'm pretty surely guessing, is the, um, is the dependency stuff. And the other ones, well, I don't know. Which <laughs> I'll just trust it. Um, now, to, this is almost pretty much it. I mean, one of the things that you also might encounter there is, is when you update. I mean, if you update the Java version, um, that technically, if you use Docker files, um, that means you have to find a new base image. And in particular, after moving, many people have hopefully moved from Java 8 to 11. Now they can already have 18. Um, there was a shift that some of the images did were not continued. And so you, have, you had to find new images. This is always, yeah, it, it, it can be solved, but it's, it's, it's time consuming. Now, if I use the build packs, I can export this version and say, I'm going to override that. And then I do the, and let's see if that works. So yeah, it's using Java 18. It has picked that up. So again, it will use the same base image but then um, it will also use um, a, a validated Java build environment and a Java run environment. And yeah, so this is the, the, the concept, basically taking as many things away fr from a developer decision as you can and say, well, I provide you something which has been repeatedly tested and used. So those Paketo build packs are basically the technology which comes out of the build packs of Cloud Foundry. So they are pretty bulletproof. And now, just to finalize things, this is like a Go sample application. So with that Go command, I would just, I think, invoke Go build. And so 
So this one um, would have directly uploaded the, the, the image to, um, to, the, to the Docker Hub. It gave it a bit of an odd name, so I'm pretty sure you can override it. Um, the other option would just say to say, okay, build app. Go, and in this case, now different build packs will be detected. This is not a Java application anymore. This is a Go application. So that, of course, also means you can use those um, the same the same invocation and the same basically templated mechanism across a multitude of your applications. All right, I think that's pretty much it. I think I have ten minutes left. Um, in case you have any questions, well, that's actually me. That wasn't. That used to be me. <laughs> before the COVID times. Now, this is the, this lab repo. So if you want to like, try this yourself and repeat some of those steps, you can, you can take um, a screenshot there. And um, yeah, first of all, I would like to say thanks for listening. <laughs> More questions? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, this is a good question. I can, um, so with pack, if you just run pack, um, it has a, a function which says suggest builders. So the, the, the builder image is basically the golden image as you have just mentioned. Um, and you can say, see there are ones from Google, there are one from Heroku, there are one from Paketo. These are like the, the ones which are officially suggested by uh, by this tool, or like they are compliant with the cloud native build pack specification. But nevertheless, you can build your own ones. On, and you can also in, embed your own build mechanisms. And I think, I mean, of course, if you have a bigger company and a more variety of, of, of environments, then this will definitely help because that will basically then be the source of truth for all the base images that are being used across, uh, across all environments. And if somebody decides not to use them, they will have probably to explain why. Okay, thanks. What do you, what do you as a as, you know, consultancy, what do you recommend to your clients? What, what do I recommend? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it depends. <laughs> you would have guessed that. No, um, I mean, in, in general, not only for building container images, um, if it comes to cloud, I would also say, say use the highest cloud abstraction that you can. If you don't, I can have something as a SaaS service. Don't rebuild it yourself. Then just use it and 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 buy it if if, if the price is okay, of course. Um, and 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 same thing goes for pretty much everything. If something is a problem that have been already has has already been solved, then try to use that. Um, and in case it doesn't work, then look at the other options. I mean, it's, it's still the same with this one. I don't have any problem with, with Docker files, and I, I hope this, I don't make this impression. It, it, especially the Docker file is the only option that, that will always work for like every, every programming language, every framework, and so on. But in, in turn, it means, well, you need to maintain it, and you're the owner from that level of the stack. So um, whenever... I go to clients, of course, I, um, I do a similar presentation and say, I want to introduce that. In the end, it's not my decision, it's yours. But I would recommend to start uh, with a possibility that takes a few problems away. And, and if we figure out, and then we just try it. I mean, the easy and the good thing with those technologies, they, they, they don't need a big change and turn in your overall um, architecture. Uh, I mean, most of the environments are running um, in, in pipelines nowadays. So you just define a new pipeline where you have a, an alternative build mechanism. And trying that is not so expensive. And then just iterating it over and over again gives you more confidence. So this would be the approach that I, 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 would, I would take. And um, yeah, also if I come and see that people would use Docker files like the one um, I had in the beginning, I said, well, you can do it this way, but these are the risks that you have associated with that. And if they say, well, this is what I'm going to live with, then I, I can only say it. I mean, does, is that enough as an answer? Okay, good. Yes, please. Yeah, just a few cents to add. Uh, if you want to stay still with Docker files, uh, you use this in your company. Uh, I highly recommend you to have a look on Canico. 
Okay. It's open source product and it's a root, uh, rootless. You don't need the root. You don't need Docker. So and you can run this in your pipeline with no access. Uh, another one is Builder. That's mm -hmm. also open source. Really good one. And if you want to stick with the pack, uh, build packs, uh, there is a tool that helps to solve uh, even not one single issue build, but also to deploy. Uh, the tool named uh, uh, Waypoint from HashiCorp, mm -hmm. which is also good. It, it can build your um, software and also deploy this either to Nomad or Kubernetes. Okay. Well, thanks. So to repeat, I'm not sure if everybody heard it. So it's it's Canico, Waypoint, and Builder as additional open source toolings. So yeah, um, if my arm goes fine again, I have to. I will try to update my presentation to those. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, this is all actually a good point. I mean, I've showed that diagram in the beginning. There are various options, but um, that there is no. Uh, this, this is never going to be complete. There will also be new things evolving and coming up. I just happen to show those that I have most experience with, but that doesn't mean that the ones I did not show are in any case worse. It's just like that I, I haven't probably touched them yet. But yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Yep. Yeah. What about the difference between the builder and the target image? For example, the multi-stage. The, the, well, the multi-stage... Can, can you specify it with uh, build packs, for example? Well, you can, um, but that's kind of against the theory of things. Because, um, I mean, basically the, the build packs, they come with a predefined image that they have checked and validated on their end. So they say, if, if you download our image, or our builder image, um, then you're gonna get this as a, as, a, as a base image for your containers, and we can give it to you because we have run the tests with it and scanned it, which you might have not. But if you exchange it on your own will, then you basically override exactly that, that possibility. But technically, I think you can, and, and, and if the, 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 like the predefined builders don't allow that. I, I know, for example, that Chip and Co allow that, so you can specify your, your custom base image now. But I never did, because I, I just used what Google suggests, because they have built it and tried it. I don't, I actually, I'm not so keen in working on those base image layers anyway. So if somebody solves that problem for me, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, and I, if you don't want that, I, I, I like the mechanisms, but I, I want different, um, different contents, then there is an API to build your own builder images. And there's, I know from, from people that have done that successfully, so this is not just an option. I wanted to ask about the .m2, for example, or the Go applications that does not need all the big size of the builder image. Okay, no, no, the, that's a good point. The builder image, is not going to be the base image. So, um, so we have here that builder image, which is 1.17 gigabytes. Um, and as you can see, the, um, the Go app I just built, or the, the Java app, they are by far not bigger than 1.17. So this builder image basically contains or contains the reference to the base image that it later on uses. I think you should actually see it somewhere. Here, there is like, this is, that's there. So yeah, I mean, still, you will be able to get your images smaller than that, especially if you use like Go or something, which is just a binary and you can use a distro-less container. Um, but that might be better for certain attacks because it don't have, doesn't have a shell and things like that. In turn, you won't be able to rebase things like in a way that I showed before. So, yeah, it's, it depends on the nature of your environment, which one might be better. All right, but I think it's really time to go to the Guinness storehouse now. <laughs> so thanks very much. I mean, I, um, we as, I'm the only one here from my company this time. I'm sure next time we'll come back with more people, so we're not sponsoring or having a booth yet. But if you have any more questions after this talk, feel free. You, as I said, you can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter and just ping me. Uh, tomorrow I'm, I'm going to be just floating around in case you want to chat. Feel just free to, to reach out to me. All right. Thanks again.